Hey guys, Miss Marusic here, and in this video, we're going to talk about combustion reaction calorimetry. Now, if I want the best possible setup in order to calculate the heat change of a combustion, then the piece of equipment that I would ideally want to use is what is called a bomb calorimeter. Here is an example of a bomb calorimeter. It has some very distinct traits to it. Um, we have an inside container where I could put my fuel that I'm trying to combust, trying to burn. I have some electrodes running into it so I can get that burning process started. And then I have water surrounding that container. The water would be what's absorbing the heat that this combustion process is losing. So then that water is held in place by an external canister. So that's the outside of the calorimeter itself. It's gonna be very well insulated to ensure all of the heat changes happening inside of this calorimeter. And then I notice that I have a temperature probe or a thermometer going into the water to get my delta T of the water. And then I also have a stirrer here to mix up the heat in the water to ensure it's getting evenly distributed. As you can see, that's a pretty fancy setup. And unfortunately, those are really expensive. So even though this is ideal, this is usually what we end up using, kind of a more simplified setup here. So I have some sort of canister of water that is basically suspended above a sample here that I'm burning. And you could have, you know, some sort of hydrocarbon fuel underneath here. Um, we've even done experiments where you have a candle that you're burning to measure the heat change of the candle. Here they've got a piece of food burning so they can measure the heat change and possibly even calculate the calories that that food is releasing as it burns. But the problem with this setup is that the assumption that the water is gaining all of the heat being lost by the burning is not as good of an assumption. There's a really good chance that some of this heat is going to the air and not going straight into that water there. However, we still make the same assumption that we do here that the change in heat of the system, the combustion reaction that's taking place, is equal to the opposite heat change of the water. That whatever the system, the reaction is losing, is being gained by the water. It's a great assumption here, not so good of an assumption there. But we sometimes account for that within our error analysis. So here's the deal. The reason why we have to do these calculations using the water is because I'm trying to measure bonds breaking and forming in the reaction. But the problem is, is I can't stick a temperature probe directly into the reaction and figure out what's happening. I don't know the specific heat of that reaction. There's a lot of things about it that I don't know. However, I know a lot of information about water. And so as we do these calculations, we're gonna be able to do our MCAT for the water and assume that the reaction is doing the opposite. So let's see an example of this in action here. It gives us on this example that we have a 0 0.303 gram sample of sucrose sugar burned in a bomb calorimeter containing 240 grams of water. And what I did is I drew myself a little picture here. Now, I didn't draw a bomb calorimeter. I drew a simplified one, but it still gets the point across. Here's my sample of sugar that is burning, and I'm going to have my water suspended. And what I'm going to assume is that all of the heat from this burning is going to that water. It also tells me that during the process, the temperature of the water changed from 22.53 to 27.55 degrees Celsius. So well, I went ahead and wrote that data over here. It also says that assume that no heat was lost or gained by the calorimeter itself, which is a pretty good assumption on a bomb calorimeter situation. So it tells us here that we want to calculate the heat change of the combustion of sugar. But here's the problem. I know with a calorimeter problem, I should be using the MCAT formula, MC delta T. But think about the only piece of information I know right now about sugar. All I know is the mass of sugar. That's it. And I don't have enough information to calculate an MCAT value for sugar directly. But think about what I do know. I know for the water, 
the mass of the water, the temperature change of the water, and here they give me specific heat of water. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to calculate this MCAT for water. Now I have to be really careful. What I see people boo-boo all the time is they put their specific heat of water, their temperature change of water, and then they put the wrong mass here. So make sure that all of this data is for the water, those surroundings. And when I calculate with that, I end up seeing that I get a positive 50-40 joules. So what that means is that my surroundings, my water, gained 50-40 joules. Now, think about the assumption we make. We assume that whatever the water gained was lost by the system, by the reaction. So what that means is that if my water gained that 50-40 joules, that the system, the sugar reaction, the combustion, lost that 50-40 joules. Now here's the problem. That 50-40 joules is very specifically for burning 0.303 grams. That if I burn 0.303 grams of sugar, I'm going to release a negative 50-40 joules, which by the way, does come out in joules because of that specific heat. So be really careful there. This is not a kilojoule situation. But what I want to eventually find is what is called a molar heat of combustion for that sugar, for sucrose specifically. And when we do that, it is a kilojoules per mole of that compound that we're combusting. So what we need to do is we need to think about, okay, if I'm releasing 50, 40 joules when I burn 0.303 grams of sugar, then how many kilojoules would I release when I burn one mole of that sugar? So hopefully we can see that we need to get that grams of sugar into moles to make this work. And so that's what I did right here. I started with my 0.303 grams. I went and calculated the molar mass of my sugar, which is 342.34, and I converted this into moles. Now that gets a really small number for moles, but that makes sense because I had a really small mass here. I mean, I had a, basically a third of a gram, so I'm not gonna have very many moles. So what I did then is I said, okay, if I wanted kilojoules per mole, I need to take this negative 50, 40 joules and convert it into kilojoules. So that's what I did here. I moved my decimal over three places. And so that gets a negative 5.04 kilojoules. I'm going to divide that by the number of moles of sugar that I had. And what that gets me is that I release a negative 5,690 kilojoules when I burn a whole entire mole of sugar. So this is my molar heat of combustion. Now it asks us some additional questions down here. It says, for the above reaction of sugar, do you think the combustion is endothermic or exothermic? Should heat be listed as a reactant or product of the reaction? Now I'll be honest, there's several ways to know here that this process was exothermic. First off, you notice that the temperature increased for the surroundings, for the water, and that means it would feel hot to the touch, and so that would indicate it's exothermic. Also, when I really thought through everything, the delta H of the reaction did come out to be negative. Now, I know you really had to decide that, but hopefully we see how that worked, that you know the water gained because the reaction lost, and so that delta H should have been negative. So what that all means is that heat flows from the system to the surroundings. I'm flowing from the reaction to the water surrounding the reaction. So our combustion is exothermic here. And of course, if it's exothermic, then that means heat is a product. One more question here. It says, in reality, let's be real, the calorimeter itself may have absorbed some of the heat produced by the reaction. Even on a bomb calorimeter, there's a chance that that insulated container could absorb a little bit of heat. And so what it asks us here is what effect would that have on the temperature change of the water? And then what effect would that have on our calculated heat change? So it says here, if the calorimeter absorbs heat, what that means is all the heat I'm releasing is not going to the water. 
Uh, most of it's going to the water, but there's a little bit going to calorimeter itself. So if not all the heat is going to the water, then that means that that water is not absorbing as much heat as it really should be if it's getting all of it. And so what happens is that we don't see quite the temperature change that it should have gotten. And if that magnitude of the temperature change is less, then the heat change I calculate will be less as well. So I will warn you, it is very common on these calorimeter problems that when I get my delta H here of say a kilojoules per mole of the combustion, that this value is really less in magnitude than what it really should be. That that is a common error we see on these problems. All right, I hope we're feeling good about calculating a combustion reaction stoichiometry problem. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.